Hello, folks. Okay, this time we want to get a little deeper into the idea of separate compilation. So last time around, we introduced the concept, this idea that you know if we've got a program that's split up across multiple files, we can compile each one individually into a .o file, an object file, and then link them all together somehow at the end. And we introduced the idea of header files containing, if you like, the contract between these things. So uh, if one file provides the implementation of a data type and another file uses it, they both refer to the header that tells them, okay, here are the ground rules for how this data type will be defined or used. So we looked at that last time around. I want to get into a slightly trickier example this time and look at some of the issues that crop up. So the example that we're going to use is that we're going to have a basic data type, um, who knows what it might be, that's defined in a data.h header file and whose implementation is in data.cpp. So you can think of any data type you want for this. Maybe it's a bit vector or something. So this data.h has some definitions and some functions or methods that are implemented in data.cpp. Then we've got some linked list code. So we'll put a header file for our linked list that's got, you know, who knows the class definition or the data type definition or um, the function headers listed in it. And then an implementation in linked list dot, or ellist.cpp. But let's assume that our linked list makes use of whatever data type is defined in data.h. So our linked list depends on our data.h. Now let's suppose we've got another data type, a tree. And again, this tree.h will define the class or the functions and methods and data types for our binary tree. And then the full implementation will be in tree.cpp. And again, let's assume that this one also depends on whatever primitive data type we put in data.h. So let's assume lists and trees are independent of one another. So tree depends on data.h, the linked list depends on data.h, .h, but they're unrelated to one another. Then finally, let's say we've got a program. So we've got a header file for it that's got some definitions specific to the program and the implementation of the program in prog.cpp. And let's suppose that it uses trees and linked lists. So it depends on both tree and linked list which both, of course, in turn depend on this data.h. So I'm just going to skip forward for a sec. We've got this kind of structure where we've got our data.h and its cpp file. We've got our ellist.h and its cpp file. We've got our tree.h and its cpp file. And we've got our prog.h and its cpp file. So prog.h is going to need to include our linked list, which is going to need to include our data prog.h is also going to need to include tree.h, which is going to need to include tree. or include data.h. And then each of the .cpp files is going to need to include its own header file. So prog.cpp is going to need to depend on prog.h, tree.cpp is going to need to include tree.h, you know, data.cpp on data.h, and our ellist.cpp on our ellist.h. So we've got this include hierarchy where we think about which files need to include which other ones for them to be able to compile the way we want and be linked together later on. So each of these things will have a hash include or two hash includes in the case of our prog.h. And we just have this idea of, okay, which things depend on which header files and which header files depend on which other header files, right? The list.h and the tree.h depend on the definitions in that data.h. So we've got this hierarchy of includes in the program that we're creating in these. So now we've got eight files for our program and it's still a pretty simple program, but we've got eight files for it, right? Four header files, four program files, and a bunch of different includes. Now the includes are transitive. So again, this is basically a cut and paste operation uh, just before the compiler actually starts compiling. It goes through and does all these hash includes. So when prog.h hash includes the linked list.h, 
that's actually, since linkedList.h also hash includes the data.h, effectively all of that stuff from data.h and our linkedList.h is winding up in prog.h. And similarly, since prog.h includes tree.h, which includes data.h, all of the code for both of those is effectively getting cut and paste into prog.h before the compiler goes ahead with it. And then prog.cpp is hash including that. So effectively all of this, all of these header files are getting hash included into prog.cpp before prog.cpp actually gets compiled. So it is this kind of transitive sequence where it's going to go off and say, okay, well, I'll include that. Oh, that needs to include that. Oh, that needs to include that. So we'll grab all of them and include it in prog.cpp. Now, as you uh, probably picked up when I picked up on when I was doing that, this means that prog.h has all of the definitions from data.h twice, right? It all got cut and paste once going through tree.h, and it all got cut and paste again going through the llist.h. Now, if we actually went ahead and did that and tried to compile it, and we had all of the code from data.h in our file twice and then started compiling, and the compiler is going to yell at us because we're trying to redefine something. We've got the same definitions for something twice. The compiler doesn't bother to check that they are the exact same definition. It just says, hey, you can't define that. You've already defined it. So it would lead to errors when we try and compile. So we need a way around that. We need a way to prevent duplicated includes. It's difficult to do from the end of whoever's doing the including, right? It would be difficult for me to say when I'm writing prog.h, you know, go off and include um, tree.h and go off and include uh, ldist.h, but only include data.h from one of them. Especially since, you know, these chains can get very long. I can have this file that includes another one that includes another one that includes another one that includes another one. So the chain can go way back there. And when you're writing something like your prog.h, you don't want to have to go back through all of the chains for all of these other files and see if they both include the same thing somewhere way back there. So what we want to do is to have some way that a file can basically say, please don't include me more than once. So that if I do get included more than once, well, so, so that essentially it doesn't happen. So that it gets included the first time the compiler sees something, but after that it goes, oh, I've already seen the definition for that. I don't need to include that one again. And this is where we start using more preprocessor directives, the hash if not def and hash define. So the hash if not def is saying, if something's not defined yet, do blah. And the hash define is giving the preprocessor the definition of something. So that's where we're going to go with this. And again, hopefully you've run across this, but I, this will be new for some of you. So the idea is we come up with a unique identifier for the file, for the .h file that we're playing with right now. So this is all going in a, a header file someplace. You know, when I write my data.h, for instance, I'm going to stick in something here that says, if you haven't seen the identifier, I don't know, this is the include for data h. Right, something that we think is not going to get used anywhere else. So say, if you, so this is again an instruction to the preprocessor, if you haven't seen this term defined yet, and I come up with some identifier, define it now. So hash define whatever the same word is. And then I would have all of the actual code for that data.h file, for instance, for all of the header file. So this, and then we have an end if at the end saying, okay, this is the end of the stuff to associate with this hash if not def. So the way it works is the compiler's going through, it sees an include for, you know, a hash include for data.h. It goes off, grabs data.h, and then it sees this in the data.h. It says, um, if you haven't seen, you know, data.h or, or data.h or whatever our identifier is here, define it and grab all of the code from data.h. And so the first time it sees this, the first time it includes data.h or data.h, it actually goes off and grabs all this code and cuts and pastes it into wherever it is right now. 
if later on, because of another sequence of hash includes, it sees data.h included again, it comes back and on the subsequent include says, if you haven't seen this term, ah, but by then it will have seen that you know data h or whatever our made up identifier was because we hash included it earlier. So the second time through it says, oh, I've already seen that term. I don't need to do any of this stuff and it skips ahead to the end if and you don't wind up including the code the second time. So you're going to see these kind of wrappers around pretty much all of the C++ header files that you wind up working with. And they're just a way, you know, this is a habit you want to get into whenever you create a header file. Stick in a guard like this, the hash, if not def, some identifier that you've made up for that file, hash define, again, that identifier for that file, the actual code for the file, and then a hash end if. And that way, you know, even if you're not planning on including this in a whole bunch of places now, maybe a week from now or a month from now or two years from now, it does wind up getting hash included all over the place. And we do need the safety of this guard. If you get into the habit of putting this stuff in your header files, the first time you create them, you're gonna save yourself a lot of grief. So this idea of guards, these preprocessor guards to ensure that something doesn't get included more than once. So now we can go back and we compile that uh, handy dandy example, right? We do this separate compilation on data.cpp and lList.cpp and tree.cpp and prog.cpp and create, whoop, geez, yet another typo. So that should be a dot O. So we want to compile data.cpp dash O data dot O, right? So we create our four dot O files and then we link them all together with one more instruction, right? We tell G++ compile these 4.0 files and call the executable whatever, progx. So that will go through and assuming we haven't made any syntax errors, it'll actually do all the compilation. It'll check all of the calls to the different .h functions and whatnot against their definitions. It'll check the implementations against their definitions and so when we do this final linking stage, everything should work out. So back to the problem of what happens if we change one of our .cpp files. In this case, like with the earlier example, if we're simply changing one .cpp file, obviously we need to recompile it, right? We need to update its .o file because its code has changed. And then we need to link them together again so that the executable includes the updated code. So if I change any one of those four .cpp files, I just recompile that one file and then relink. Or if I changed two of the .cpp files, I would recompile those two .cpp files, again using the dash C, and then relink at the end. If we're changing a header file, we have to think about which things depend on that header file. So if we skip back to our diagram, where did we go here? So if we take a look at, say we change prog.h, the only file that actually uses prog.h is prog.cpp. So we'd have to recompile that one and relink. If we change tree.h though, well, both tree.cpp and through prog.h, prog.cpp make use of the definitions in that. So we'd have to recompile those two and then relink. If we were to change ellist.h, again, clearly we need to recompile ellist.cpp because that depends directly on it. And we'd also need to recompile prog.cpp because through prog.h, it also depends on it. So we'd recompile those two and then link everything together again. If we were to recom if we were to edit data.h, well, all of a sudden, you know, data.cpp depends on it, and then through tree.h, tree.cpp does, and through list.h, list.cpp does, and through list.h and prog.h, prog.cpp does. So if we edit data.h, we actually have to recompile everything and then relink. So we do need to think carefully about, based on this sort of cascading or hierarchy of includes, 
if we edit one of the header files, what are all the different things that need to be recompiled because of that? And again, most IDEs now will go through and look at your hash includes and figure out what cascading sequence it needs. But we want to do that manually to make sure we understand what's going on. And then we'll rebuild things. And this is where we'll get into talking about make files to automate this process ourselves. Figure out what the rules actually are. OK. Um, I did want to mention a few things in terms of compiler options, uh, specifically with G++. We've looked at the dash C option to say just compile this one separately. It's not a complete program. We've looked at the dash O saying here comes the name of the file that I want to stick the results in, um, either the executable or the .o file that we want to create. There are a few others. Dash capital W stands for warning. So dash W all turns on all warnings, which is actually a little misleading because it doesn't really turn on all warnings. Um, there's dash W uppercase W extra that turns on a few things that all doesn't. So these are ones that we'll use pretty much all the time. This term turning on wall and extra, if you like for our G++ options. Um, there's a dash capital O option that turns on some basic optimizations. And there's actually multiple different levels of this. There's an 01, 02, 03, 04 that tell the compiler to spend more time compiling, um, but in the process generate what's hopefully a more efficient or more compact uh, executable as a result. And then the dash G option is the other one that I wanted to mention. This turns on debugger support. This brings us back to the idea of symbol tables that we were talking about uh, a couple of sessions ago where with the dash G option, the compiler says, oh, okay, I'll throw the symbol table in with the executable so that the debugger has that information available to it. So these are a few of the common options that we'll see thrown into our compilation flags or in our compilation instructions. And we'll come back and look at these as we're building our own automated compilation system with MIC files next time around. All right, we'll leave it there.